welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. We're here in delightful Chicago, Illinois, in what is to be our 100th interview, 100th episode. We're here with Leslie Grimm. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Great to see you. Great to see you. Leslie and I were in uh, uh, grad school together at Northwestern University some three decades ago. Well, like three, <laughs> three years ago. Three years Very ago. Very recently. Okay. Finishing. And uh, uh, Leslie is a senior lecturer in clarinet at Northwestern University, and uh, I think Chicagoland's, uh, certainly one of Chicagoland's most prolific clarinet freelancers. Busy girl. Busy, very busy. Thanks for coming in for this interview. Absolutely. And Leslie is the first woodwind interview that uh, TPTV has had. So we're especially, we're doubly honored to have you. Well, it's very exciting. I'm excited to talk about Jake and his legacy and what it's meant to me. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, while in, at, at uh, grad school at Northwestern, uh, Leslie studied, of course, with the clarinet professor, but she also started studying with Mr. Jacobs. I did. I was a student of Marcellus's at the time, doing my master's degree, and um, of course loved studying with him, but was sort of up against a wall with my breathing and tension and sort of um, the inhibitions um, that I couldn't seem to, to find. And it was um, Jacob that I will say that seemed to pull me out of that stuck spot. Wow. What did, do you remember what he did for you, what those those first lessons? Well, first of all, what drew you? I mean, why, how did you know about Jacobs as a woodwinder? I knew about Arnold Jacobs because I guess at Northwestern, how do you not know about him? Um, I knew a lot of brass folks like you and a lot of folks that spoke um, highly of him and um, many that encouraged me to go take some lessons when I shared my own struggles with breathing and tension. Mm. And um, boy, so happy I got that advice and was able to follow up on it. Well, what do you remember about that first lesson or two? Or I think being so sort of overwhelmed by his expertise, he spoke about um, breathing in such a different way. And um, m maybe mostly the sense that there was a light at the end of this tunnel. I had studied it and studied it and studied it because that's sort of who I am, sort of persistent and hardworking. Um, but my teachers always said, oh, just try harder or run more or smoke or, or just whatever. Or just do anything to just relax some or if I just were stronger or something. And so I, I didn't do the smoking, but I did, you know, I was a hard, hard worker and um, just could seem to get nowhere from it. And then going in to work with Jake, those first couple lessons, I actually saw that I did have the capability to take some good breaths. And I also noticed, I thought I already had a, a good sound. Um, but how much better it was when the inhalation was relaxed that the exhalation was so much more pure and beautiful. So I was, I was pretty impressed with that. Well, what, following up with that, what did he do uh, in the first lesson or two that helped you to see that light at the end of the tunnel? What was, do you remember what it was that he told you or did with you or any I of that? I think it was more, um, he certainly measured lung capacity and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't have guessed I had a small lung capacity. And he said I had five liters, which was large for a woman. And um, that I think just was started showing me with the tubes and the spirometers and that kind of thing that I could simply take in air more easily and therefore exhale it. So he got you to, uh, um, through the, the, the use of the devices, the external stuff, the incentive things, mm -hmm. he got you to take in more of that five liters yes. than you had. Maybe you were only taking two and a half. Or, Absolutely. Or something like that. Absolutely. And I think, I don't, I, from the way I think of it now, I don't um, distinguish much between how you inhale compared to how you exhale. I can, with my own students or in my own thinking with myself, I can work on either end of those and I'm working sort of on both of them. And so in some ways, I think at that time, I was just a mess about my exhalation. And so to, to realize that you could sort of do less at that point and work less that, at that point. And I think a lot of Marcellus students um, had that too, a lot of constriction, a lot of the body pulled down to play. We set our horn always on our knees, sort of cuddling the clarinet instead of being open and tall like a, a brass player. You would never do this. But we all um, were taught that and, um, you know, emulated that for some reason. And I think I realized that there were some other options. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, uh, find yourself teaching the same 
thing with your students? What do you notice in your own students that you harken back to your, your studies with Jake that you try to apply? I think for me, my own studies were sort of um, circuitous. I, I went to a lot of colleges, a lot of, um, so a lot of teachers. It wasn't a real consistent, steady approach from one teacher who really had the basics set for me. And so I felt that starting with Arnold Jacobs and all the work I did after that, I was someone who ended up putting fundamentals on top of some icky bedrock, you know? And that even as I got older, I had to shred the bedrock a little bit away to just go into some really solid material that I think is really on the foundations of what um, Jacob taught of just free air, a clear product in your mind and demanding the product. So when I teach, I think my students are so awesome and I do such a good job with them only because I'm so passionate about that we need to do this in the most simple way possible, that we need to do this um, in a way that's going to last. I need to find you as a human. How can you do this best? And then we're just going to throw a clarinet at it. Mm -hmm. And I love doing that and I'm, I don't know, I think I've had a great success with it. I think that's one of the things that made him so successful is, is he he took private teaching out of the do as I say because this is what this is what works for me into the do as I say because this is what works for humans. Yes. And just starting with you as a human. I love that, yeah. and I love that in terms of psychology. You could go on and on about it, but to really meet my students where they are, not give them a bunch of shoulds if they're only practicing for the clarinet world. Two hours is not so much. If if they're not practicing a whole lot, instead of saying you should practice more, it's kind of like well what's going on with you that, that that's your limit? And how can we work on, on the tissues that are in place holding you at maybe two hours instead of four? Um, and not just so much looking for end products all the time in terms of like looking for a huge goal that's very far away. But the goal is the, to me the process. And it's again meeting you exactly where you are or, or there sort of is no process. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of heady talk, but I, I think it really stems from what Jake first started me on many years ago. That's great. Leslie, you were talking about uh, not, not differentiating between inhalation and exhalation, and that, that reminds me that uh, it seemed like for Jacobs it was, he didn't use these words, but my words, paraphrasing, you know, as far as the air goes, garbage in, garbage out. How the air goes in is going to be more or less how it goes out. So if it's tight going in, or tense going in, it's going to be tense or tight going out. Is that, was that your experience? Very much so, and I, I love that I can work on both ends of that with my students and get results on both ends. I can work on the inhale, and you can use blow bags, you can do all kinds of stuff to soften things up. Um, I, I've studied a lot of Alexander techniques, so adding just that sort of body just relaxation into the concept that air going in the body um, and then turning that around and working with students on how they're exhaling and we can see air coming out of the body with the use of blow bags and spirometers and things like that um, and it all sort of adds up to me yeah all those gadgets so they, they were sometimes people get uh, confused they, they look at the gadgets as a as an ends in and of themselves but they're not they're they're not the end they're the they're just the the way to get you to do what you need to do. That's what I think. It's like this process. That's all we have right now is this process. And I, um, I, I think I see a lot of teachers with all the spirometers lined up on their desk and stuff. And I see sometimes they'll work with their students, and I, I think, well, that doesn't really smell like what I'm imagining it. It could be or should have or could, just could be used as. And um, so I think there's really creative, clever ways of using them, or there are ways of using these gadgets in the same negative way that I used to play the clarinet, and that just work harder, work harder, work harder, instead of be open, listen, notice that, have fun with the blow bag or the spirometer or something, mm -hmm. and sort of enga really engage with that moment instead of, um, looking down the road at that symphony job you wanted or something. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, do you, what, with your students, what do you use, how do you use the, the various uh, gadgets? Mm -hmm. I, I especially like just the basic five the liter blow bag. bag. Yeah. I'm a okay. real, real fan of that. It's, um, the uh, technical term is anesthesia bag, just to, for the audience. Excellent, yeah. okay, and of course I didn't bring mine with me because it's in my office at Northwestern, but, um, <laughs> But what I do, I, I, 
the most obvious thing so just a lot of inhaling and exhaling without getting dizzy yeah. you know um watching the bag that fascination with the bag getting small and large it's like having a lung almost outside your body how cool is that and then um with the clarinet there's there's so much that happens with the air that we can't we can't necessarily know too easily when we're busy playing the clarinet but if you have a blow bag and you're just blowing through it um and then you start that's a simple thing to do is to blow into a blow bag but once i have my students or even myself start to imagine a mozart concerto on top of that even just visually imagine it i'm not even singing it yet i'm, I'm imagining the music or even looking at the music it becomes much harder to blow in sort of an innocent way when you have this demanding thing in front of you visually also so i i work with my students to just have them notice when their breath hitches um and then actually tonguing and articulating in the blow bag to um, play the Mozart on the blow bag and see where they're manipulating things instead of just leaving the tongue alone and getting air to the front of the mouth, which is very similar to what the brass family members do. It's just all the air and we have something in our mouth, that's the stopping point at the reed in the mouth. And um, it's how you deliver that air to the front of the mouth. Um, so I think the blow bag is something, I just love that, I think it's a great tool. Do you recall any anything that he said, clarinet specific with you in terms of his work with you or was it just all just generally as you as a human? I think much more, yeah, as a human and um, even I have spent some, you know, there's a lot of woodwind players that um, would say no, 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 this doesn't apply to us because we don't just waste air into the clarinet, it's not all about just getting tons of air into the clarinet. Um, but it is always about how free is the air as it gets to the clarinet. Um, and so as a clarinet person, I think I probably came to him with a lot of, well, my teacher says this, and a lot of, you know, well, if you can't just blow like you're playing the tuba. So um, I don't re really remember specific counters to that, but I, I know that over time I came to see that it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the thing about the, the bag and the, the anesthesia bag and then the spirometers is it really takes what is very subjective air, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of understanding what it's doing, when it's doing, where it's going, mm -hmm. you know, what it feel like and all that, into making it very objective because then all of a sudden you can see the bag getting bigger. You I can see the, the ball going up or the piston going up. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, that's a really great thing to do. Otherwise, Jake would, Jake would always say we don't we don't we're not wired to really monitor life within us absolutely um, well at all because you know, we have some pain receptors and that sort of thing we're very well wired to manage life without us you know right. out, out, outside of us and certainly neurologically it's very twisted to be busy putting something out and taking something in this our brain is not designed to do that right and um, it's not a successful approach did you so when you would have these lessons uh, with Jacobs, you would uh, you said you had a you notice your sound increasing. What was that? To what do you attribute the sound increasing? I think he just got me to exhale more freely, and he did. I think it, it's sort of a um, getting rid of so much intention on my part or, or intensity or something. A way of just stripping that down and coming back to a very simple. Oh, I'm someone who can let air move freely out of my mouth. Let's do that on the clarinet. And he talked about different hats of people. I remember that putting on Larry Combs's hat, you know, and play that with Larry's hat, you know. And there's something so valuable about that too. Just the notion of how your imagination can create something totally different than without your imagination. Do you think, like for us, as he would sometimes, you know, imagine just blowing out a candle. And I used to carry candles with me. Everywhere. So you would do that with him. <laughs> yes. So this is how bending the flame of the candle, blowing out the candle. Oh, so you would get into very to, uh, degrees of moving the flame. Yeah, because oh. you guys, that no. why would you do that? Yeah, we would. And that yeah. was kind of useless for me to just blow it out. Like the real thing on the clarinet is to sustain steady, 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 um, fast, small amounts of compressed air. And it's um, quite different from you guys in yeah. that I think you're blowing huge quantities of air and I think we're fast small amounts of air. I mean, I think it's, it's more like the trumpet, more akin to the trumpet. I think so, where the tongue does a lot of compressing up at the mouth and it just everything is up at the lips and the front of the mouth. Now do you think about the tongue being compressed or are you just thinking about a particular 
air thickness and speed and that sort of thing? Or what did that? Did, probably air thickness and speed, speed and sort of where you're placing the air. So the tongue is a, is a derivative of, of, of that. It's not, yes. a, it's not a causative. No, it, or your thoughts. maybe my thoughts are we think like E, like maybe a okay. U as O or something yeah. like that. Um, definitely using vowel sounds. To, to, to me, again, that's just this human thing we're all good at. I, I know how to say E and E and U. And, mm -hmm. and those are all tangible things to use for clarinet playing. Yeah. So I think um, the vowel sounds are very helpful. Um, I since in the last um, couple of years have explored further working with um, Keith Underwood, mm -hmm. who um, had worked with Arnold Jacobs quite a lot. And um, Keith has really helped me. Um, I think Keith stands sort of firmly on the shoulders of Arnold Jacobs, that he, he'd be nowhere without that um, sort of simple but wonderful sense of air, but then uh, Keith is a flute player and how he learned to teach woodwind players to um, compress the wind at the front of the face with the tongue. I, you know, I just want to stress that I don't think Keith would be there without the tutelage and um, prior workings of people like Arnold Jacobs. But um, yeah, Keith, I think, has done a lot. I, in my students, I, I use buzzing of all things, which probably makes no sense to you guys. I see the shock in the brass players in the room. But um, I use buzzing a lot in my clarinet lessons. I use it in my woodwind quintet coaching, and the horns look at me like I'm crazy. But um, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, and I'm not particularly gifted at that in any way. Um, <laughs> but let, let woodwind me. Woodwind player buzzing? Yeah. Holy that cow. It's just all. It's basically when I'm doing that, I'm replicating the clarinet embouchure. My bottom lip is under the top lip. My tongue is attached to my lower lip. Exactly clarinetiness that we want the, the tongue so far forward. And the lips, when I get a really good buzz going, which wasn't necessarily then, the lips start to function in this unknown psycho way um, where I don't understand it, but they start to be more coordinated and more sort of lovely. Mm -hmm. They're more in touch with one another somehow. And so then you pick up the clarinet and you have these lips that are sort of coordinated instead of just these wooden little, and I got little skinny lips, you know, these wooden little lips that you put a clarinet onto. Hmm. And oh my gosh, that has just opened doors, opened doors, opened doors. Is that doors. something that Keith uh, promotes? Yes, yes, sorry, he wow, no was, kidding. yeah. And he does all kinds of stuff with um, the spirometers and bull bags, that kind of stuff. So he, he'd be an interesting person for you to yeah. go interview sometime. Yeah, for sure. But using that buzzing, and again, like if I can get my students to buzz and I get them dancing around and buzzing, because they, they, they always want to take what I say, whether it's a blow bag or buzzing, they want to turn it into work where they go, <clears throat> and they're compressed in their belly, and I'm just like, no, let's dance and do it. Let's, you know, mm -hmm. kind of have more fun, do a hip bebop song or something for me instead of your stupid concerto. So w when you're doing that, you're sort of almost uh, mimicking the, the, the whole tight gut method that uh, Terrible. was that something that clarinet is yes the, is that in the clarinet world too big time in the clarinet world i had teachers um we'll go nameless teachers putting belts around my waist that i was supposed to compress my tummy out against that tightened belt and blow um and i think disaster for already too tense clarinet player who's struggling with breathing but it does you know there's something it does to probably speed up the the wind that may have some sort of immediate benefit but i, I just don't see it in the long run and then marcellus always talked about like sort of a beer but he beer not but beer gut, belly. yeah gut. beer yeah. belly um he was uh, a wisconsinite in his nature and just that this should be a big vat of beer and sort of that a little more gent gentle of a sense of the pressure outward and i remember um Russ Dagan was one of the teachers at the time, and he started listening more and more to what Marcellus said, and he started exploring that in his own playing, that maybe if I tense up my belly a little more, it will help my sound and what I do. And I think he felt that it, it did. Um, I think, I just can't buy it. I just can't buy that tension is, is the way to move forward in a long-term beneficial way. Did Jacobs address the tight gut with you at all? Yeah, definitely. He talked about the belly muscles. I don't know that I, I'm... Jelly there. belly? He didn't talk about it that way. Okay. I like that, though. Um, but the stomach muscles being used for, for three things. One is defense. Yeah. One is just proper breathing. And the other is number two, bathroom. Yeah, right. And so I say that to my students, and I see it just all the time. These 
cap players get into this compression battle with the whole front of the body, mm -hmm. which I don't, I don't believe that this is separated from that. It's very hard to not close your throat if your belly is that way, and then the tongue is frozen. So I don't know exactly what to make of it, but it's certainly not something I, I teach at all that my students should flex their tummy. I so, don't, so he got you, I mean, he addressed it, and then he got you to move away from that? Move away from that. But I think it's also been years of studying the Alexander Technique, Feldenkrais right. Method, right. to just like, let's leave it nice and nice and squishy down there. Yeah, and did that, and you, so you notice this in combination with the air and, and that sort of thing, you notice a, a, an increase in the quality of your, of your tone. I think so. And when you would take that to your colleagues, what, what, you know, up at school? I think there's they, still some debate on it. You know, I, I see students, I'm um, teachers working with students all the time on how they should um, tense up their tummy. Um, that's in woodwind playing, but um, I just don't think I can subscribe to it. Yeah. You know. Well, that's really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I find uh, it's so great to get your to get your point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've never had a woodwind player yeah. talk about this stuff yeah. before. So. And so much is just a steady, like you get something from Jake or, or any amazing teacher that over over time you sort of, you live with it and grow with it and sort of, um, I don't know, it grows in you. And I, I think, I, I'm so, so grateful for yeah. that. And I know I'm a better teacher for it. Well, we certainly appreciate you coming all the way in just for this, uh, this interview. Yeah. It's been how long since I, 25 years? At, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. You look great. You Thank sound you. great. <laughs> You're the same. Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. It's wonderful. And I have a gift for you. Right. This is a genuine no. Tuba People TV that water is bottle. That's too exciting. It's the uh, 2.0 edition. <laughs> I like that. We're going to change it to the Woodland People. What? Yeah. We'll have to oh, work on this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Beautiful. Thank we'll, you. We'll see how far the Woodland. Uh, series of interviews goes. Well, I will say there are many, many Woodwind players that have worked with Jacob and yeah. to um, great acclaim and success. So. Yeah. I, what prompted me to contact uh, Leslie about this was um, some months ago I was, I had come across her, um, one of her, one of her um, graduate papers and um, this particular paper was talking about the pedagogy of Ronald Jacobs. And so I was reading and I thought, I need to, I need to email Leslie. Yeah, that's when it all started. Yeah. Is my in '85 during my graduate year. Yeah. I just was astonished by him. It was great reading. I'm sure it was really <laughs> astounding. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Leslie. Thank you. It's great to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. And now back to you.